Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashish Karanchandani. I'm the president at the Nudge Foundation and also head of the Center for Rural Development. I don't need to say anything about the importance of rural development in our country. With two thirds of our population and five sixths of our poor in rural India, it is one of the most, if not the most important topic. And for today, I'm glad to welcome all of you to the rural development track. The challenge is, what do we talk about? There are so many topics. We have chosen a few and we left out many as important, if not more important. So I'll beg your indulgence in it. We're going to start the rural development track with this first session on community institutions because they can be a really important piece of infrastructure of development. We'll then have a session on FPOs, which can be invaluable in improving livelihoods of small and marginal farmers. There will also be a session on credit mobilization and a session on the graduation approach, which can mainstream most vulnerable. We have a session on Manrega, both because it is a social security net, but also has the potential of building assets for the poorest of the poor. And the last session is going to be on innovations with less focus on the individual innovation, but more on adoption and scaling. We are also going to have three targeted fireside chats, one on natural farming, one on multifaceted rural transformation, and one on FDRVC, potentially a new paradigm for FPOs. We are very fortunate to have some phenomenal panelists and speakers. And if any of you are interested in any of these topics, we we'll strongly encourage you to come and attend these events. With that, let me move on to the panel we have right now on community institutions, the next horizon. As I mentioned earlier, community institutions can be the core infrastructure for development. And India has a very vibrant history of community institutions. And we are very, very fortunate. Many of the panelists today have actually been part of the pioneering group that has built those institutions, which are the foundation of what we have. This has been picked up in many ways. Even the government is very interested in it right now. The National Rural Development, NRLM, the National Rural Livelihood Mission from the center. And as you might have even heard, uh, the Prime Minister yesterday had a session with SHGs because he also knows the value of this institution. This is also now not just at the center, but at the state level with multiple state rural livelihood missions really focusing on it. And that's why we actually thought this is a very timely topic. And with the privilege of having these specific panelists with us to actually have them talk about the path forward and what can be done to imagine the future of India with completely new dream of community institutions. Let me just very quickly introduce the panelists. They're all phenomenal individuals, and I have the privilege of knowing many of them individually. In fact, when I saw the number of them who said yes, I couldn't believe our luck. Really, really privileged to have all of you here. I'm going to start with uh, Reema Ben Nanavati. She's the Director, Rural Organizing and Economic Development at SEVA. She has been organizing self-employed women workers from the informal sector for when she joined SEVA and stayed on to become elected as the general secretary in 1999. 30 years of her selfless service was honored by the government of India with the Padma Shri in 2013 for a, distributed, for a distinguished contribution in the area of social services. Reema Ben, it's a real pleasure to have you. Reema Ben has also brought with her today Kapila Ben. Kapila Ben Vanikar is a tobacco worker. Working in the fields and in factories, she now owns a very small farm of her own as well. Kapila Ben went on to be elected as the president of SEVA from its 1.9 million members. Kapila Ben, we are really privileged to have you here with us today. I also want to introduce Vijay. Vijay has a very personal connect for me. I first entered the world of rural development with a conversation with him in Delhi almost 30 years ago. Vijay has been working with community institutions since 1980. Weavers and leather workers in Rajasthan shared micro irrigation systems with the landless who got 
Bundan land in Bihar. At Pradhan, he set up community based household poultry farms and Tassar self clearing projects with tribals. At Basics in the 90s, he was working with SHGs and their federations, dairy farmer cooperatives. And since 2010, Basics has set up over 400 farmer producer companies. Since 2018, Vijay personally has been studying community governance institutions like panchayats and zilla parishads. Vijay, welcome. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Minakshi Sundaram. So it's a real privilege to have you here today. Dr. Minakshi Sundaram has a distinguished career in the Karnataka cadre of the IAS, where he's held a number of assignments, including Director of Sericulture, Managing Director of Karnataka Milk Federation, and Principal Secretary, Rural Development and Panchayati Raj Department, as well as also being the Secretary at the Government of India in the Center for the Ministry of Rural Development. He has published books on decentralization in developing countries and on rural women, on empowerment of rural women. And as many of you know, anybody involved in the development sector, he's played a key role in Myrada starting in 1986 and to its current position where he's the chairman. Welcome, Dr. Minakshi Sundar. Also want to introduce Parmesh again a stalwart in this space. He is currently the global lead for rural livelihoods and agricultural jobs at the World Bank. In this position, he provides leadership to the bank's work in these areas and supports global development of knowledge and learning in these areas to offer solutions to the World Bank's clients and other development partners. Parmesh has a long history of work in India and among other areas was involved in designing and supporting the National Rural Livelihood Mission and Jivika in Bihar. Thank you, Parmesh, for being here today. Isabel Guerrero has also deep understanding of this space. She is now the ED of Imago Global Grassroots. She's been building this for the last seven years, a nonprofit that works with grassroots social entrepreneurs and governments around the world to scale up innovations from the base of the pyramid. In addition to being the ED of Imago Global Grassroots, she teaches scaling up for development impact at the Harvard Kennedy School since 2014. She also sits on the board of the UN University and is part of the UN High Panel, High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. Isabel is an economist and has had a stellar career at the World Bank, including being the Vice President for South Asia. Thank you, Isabel. I know you're in DC and it's early in the morning. Really appreciate your being here with us. I also want to introduce Dr. Mekla Krishnamurthy, who's going to be the moderator for the panel. Again, most of the panelists know her well. She's an associate professor of sociology and anthropology at the Ashoka University and a senior fellow and director of the State Capacity Initiative at the Center for Policy Research. Over the last 20 years, Mekla's research, policy, and professional engagements have involved work across a range of field sites and subjects, including informal women's courts, popular justice and dispute resolution, community health workers and public health, nutrition, agriculture and agricultural markets, and land, water, and livelihoods. Mekla, thank you very much for moderating the session today, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, um, Ashish. Uh, it's an incredible privilege uh, to be able to moderate uh, this uh, panel today. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, for me, it's a special privilege because I began when I started my first field work. Uh, this was in exactly 20 years ago, this time, summer of 2001. Uh, I landed up in rural Vadodara district to study Nadia Dalits that had been formed by the Mahila Samakya program. And at that time, Mahila Samakya was already it had been formed in 1988. I came in 2001. The Nadia Dalits were a few years old. Seva had already been there since 1972. Um, and what I discovered were the histories and prehistories of community institutions and community mobilization. And you know, later in my work, when I've sort of worked on agricultural markets, and we talk so much about FPOs, uh, just last uh, farmer producer organizations, just last month, we have a new ministry of cooperation. 
uh, we tend to think of these as big, bold, landmark, new moves. But there is really a rich, complex, and um, very varied and challenging history of community mobilization, of collectivization that we have in India that is also deeply regional, uh, regionally specific and has its own story. So there's a center and a state story here too. Um, and I remember all the, you know, when I started my field work, one of the most, you know, striking things about the challenges of state mobilized community institutions and the very different kinds of associational worlds that people belong to. Um, and so, you know, as we think and the, the subject here and the topic is to look forward, I think it's a really wonderful opportunity for us to also really reflect back at this history uh, and all that it has taught us and the challenges that remain and to build on that as we look forward, uh, to think about what the new horizons would be, the next horizons would be uh, fully acknowledging, I think, how diverse that is bound to be in a country like India uh, and across a whole range of different sectors, um, different kinds of purposes uh, and institutions. So um, I think this, there could be no better panel to help us do this. And as we then move forward to think about the challenges of scale and ownership and accountability. So, uh, you know, I think we're in a uh, in really wonderful hands. I know the audience is keen to get started uh, and, and so am I. So with that, I think we can begin chronologically in some ways with Seva, uh, right? And, and Reema Bain and Kapila Bain uh, to, to set us off. So I'll briefly say the format for the first session is that first round, everybody will talk about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll have some time for uh, further engagement. Um, I'm going to be extremely uh, nervous to ask panelists to stop speaking. So I would just request all of you <laughs> to please keep to time. Uh, and uh, you know, I know all of you would want to listen to each other too. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So the time is now mine, right? Great. Thank you All so yours. much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it's 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 quite wonderful on one hand, but I also feel quite odd to be on this panel with you know some some of the stalwarts uh, considered to be as gurus in their respective fields. Some who I look up to when I feel really um, in a dilemma or you know when we are being going through difficult times, especially. The last year and a half has been so difficult uh, for, I think, all of us. And uh, and therefore, I felt excited when this panel was being, uh, you know, um, conducted. And today, I speak here on behalf of our 1.8 million members of SEVA, uh, all women workers in the informal economy, but out of which about two-thirds of our members are rural members. And... Um, as we all know that in our country, there's still surplus of labor and less of economic opportunities or employment opportunities. And therefore, in order to, um, you know, give them meaningful, decent work, livelihoods and dignity, uh, community institutions definitely play a very, very important role. Um, and also, therefore, ever since SEVA began, we are, a, we are a trade union, but we call ourselves a membership-based organization of the poor. It is the members who make SEVA what it is uh, today. Um, and uh, I think, um, so therefore, we have worked with a wide range of community institutions. These are federations of self-help groups, or there's a cooperative bank, there's federation of different cooperatives in different trades, associations of community learning centers, chain of community retail businesses, community institutions of women-owned solar parks, community training centers owned by women. Uh, everything is community, community, and community because it's the women who are the owners and managers at SEVA. We build the art as a joint strategy of struggle and development of union and collectives, which go on to become women-owned and managed organizations. I would 
first like if Kapila Ben can now speak. I don't know whether she's connected or not, but if she would speak first and then I would sum up as to what she says. Um, Kapila Ben, have you said something about this? Kapila Ben? Looks like she has issues with her connection. So if she comes live in between, I will stop. But I think Kapila Ben's own um, struggle and how a community institution helped her overcome that struggle and how she's now spearheading her own community institution would have really thrown light. But I think uh, what I would really like to stay, uh, state here is that uh, based on these um, experiences of, you know, organizing women, forming their own community institutions, but under uh, women's leadership, I think which were started way before the National Rural Livelihood Mission came into being, and uh, maybe some of the learnings that came out from our experience we had also shared in designing of the National Rural Livelihoods Mission with the government as well. So what I would like to suggest is the, the future actions. Uh, what, are, what are the future actions based on a very rapid demand survey that SEVA does every year with our, our community institutions or with our membership base organizations. And one is on the demand that emerges is on lateral linkages. How do women and their organizations, uh, you know, uh, encourage peer learning? So it's community institution to community institution. Either it's in the same village, across villages, across districts, across states, and we also do across different countries as well. And these linkages um, can be for knowledge links, market links, supply links, and also for risk management links. And that's what is a major demand that um, the women members uh, or the women um, in the different regions always uh, ask for. The second important aspect which is emerging um, Kapila Ben, have you said something about it? 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 Sorry for the interruption. But uh, the second important aspect is that these organizations, we call them whether community institutions or women's organizations or membership-based organizations, they remain confined to the social sector only. Um, and they, they are not, uh, you know, the larger community, the larger society is not aware. But they have tremendous economic and political potential. And there has to be a general awareness both within the government and the private sector about the nature and extent of the community or in the institutions which are there in our country. The third and the important emerging need or the demand which is coming is on the governance of these institutions, which definitely needs a whole new deal. And this is coming up because of the major changes which have uh, come about in the recent times, access to financial institutions, social media, digital uh, um, you know, explosion that has happened. And in addition, the importance of ownership of these organizations. Um, you know, how do the ownership of these organizations is also there with the minorities, the ethnic groups in our countries, um, the Dalits, the tribals, and the workers, the women workers in the informal sector themselves. So these are some of the governance aspects that also needs more attention when we are talking about the future roadmap of the, uh, you know, uh, um, members' own organizations. The other important aspect is the need for sustained investment. 
Uh, we've seen that you know there are self-help groups, there are federations of self-help groups. But why are they not able to address the issue of poverty? And the main reason, one of the main reasons, is that uh, those institutions or organizations which are successful also need annual investments to grow and scale up. And those which are not successful also need sustained investment so that, you know, over a period of time, they are able to sustain themselves and survive and sustain themselves. So investment is an ongoing activity of these um, members-owned um, organizations. Um, therefore, I think there is now a time that uh, need to set up a livelihood recovery and resilience fund for these members owned economic organizations that will help them to scale up their enterprises, go to small and medium enterprise level and then be into the mainstream. And uh, last, I will, I'm mindful of time, Minakshi ji, so last but and the most important is that based on the demands coming from, you know, the um, assessment that we have done, um, I recommend that we need to draw a road, road map for our country, um, India, that, you know, without such a road map, the community organizations will carry the burden of the society and the economy. They will be always there to do what the needs of the communities, the issues, but will not be a driving force. When we are talking about, you know, building a whole new economic pathway, how do they become a driving force for prosperity and peace? And especially, how do women play a major role in that? Um, if at all Kapila Ben is able to come, uh, connect, then maybe she'll come in later. But thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Zima and, I'm, I'm, and hopefully we will be able to hear from Kapila Bell in the course of the, of the hour and a half. But I think um, set a forward-looking vision that's based on very, very deep experience uh, over all of these decades. And I think you made one very, very important point um, about not just thinking about community institutions as in the social sector or as, you know, putting a welfare lens on them. And I'll turn next to Vijay Mahajan. And I think this is a point you have made even in the imagination for livelihoods, right? moving beyond just credit or thinking about microfinance to livelihoods. The fact that these are economic institutions, they are part of economic life. They're also part of social and political life, of course. But actually seeing the work that community institutions do as not residual, uh, or about social security, but really as central uh, to a vision for an economy and society. I think it would be great to hear your views based on all the experience. I know Pradhan uh, is a decade on from Seva chronologically um, in, in, in this work, but I think uh, these decades, it would be wonderful to hear um, about the range of institutions <clears throat> and, and their role. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mekla. Uh, <clears throat> You know, um, I, I agree with you that uh, community institutions are the ones which cannot afford uh, to be narrowly specialized because they are embedded in the day-to-day <clears throat> -day life of their members. And Seva, of course, is a great example of that, you know, uh, where the economic life, the social life, and the political life, not in the party political sense, but in on the power relations uh, are all intertwined <clears throat> and uh, in indeed the according to me by the way the design of seva is a brilliant institutional design because for each of these they have a specialized entity a formal entity but the institution uh, itself the mother institution is the self employed women's association but for example they have the seva bank and the self help group federations for the and the occupational cooperatives for the economic side. And then they have the Mahila Seva Trust and several other things that Rima Ben talked about on the social side and so forth. So, uh, <clears throat> but coming to, you know, uh, my general view is that while, of course, the National Rural Livelihood Mission, uh, you know, is largely 
uh, a fed based on the concept of self help group and their federations at the village and the subsequent levels block or uh, higher levels uh, but the shg federations uh, numerous as they are are not the only community institutions in india in fact according to me the most preeminent community institutions in india though not as uh, as well evolved as the shgs unfortunately are the gram sabhas they are the primordial community institutions and 600000 of them you know and not to be confused with gram panchayats by the way gram panchayats are an organ of the state whereas gram sabhas are the plenary body of each village <clears throat> and likewise in their urban equivalents are the resident welfare associations of which again there are hundreds of thousands by now uh, and these are in some ways though very very imperfect and still formative but these are the the primitive uh, the the primeval uh, <coughs> community institutions and to this if we add the long history of cooperatives in india you know not just the primary agriculture cooperative societies but also dairy co-ops uh, you know other commodity co-ops fish and sugarcane and oil seeds and all of that uh, another 100000 of them you know at one time so <clears throat> so by the time we add up these uh, gram sabhas the rwas the co-ops and of course the shg federations from the vos upwards we are talking of more than a million community institution in india and is that too much according to me for a nation of uh, you know <clears throat> uh, 13 50 million people uh, uh, you know having 1.35 million community institutions would still be like one institution for every 1000 and that actually is already at the limits of direct democracy you know so uh, so i am quite happy that we have so numerous of them but <clears throat> they are not and in fact i would like to go one step further mekla uh, for your consideration particularly as an academic that there is one type of community institution which is seriously missing in our construct uh, which is the consumer union you know the 21st century human being is not just a citizen uh, she is also a consumer and unfortunately there is no law nor a legal form which has institutionalized the concept of consumers unite unionizing you know we have trade unions uh, we have associations of persons but not consumer unions even our consumer protection law does not talk about consumer unions you know and that's a serious missing link because if we have to do <clears throat> uh, take into you know establish countervailing forces to the power of corporations and the market institutions it can't be done just by regulators by the state it has to be done by by the users by consumers so let me just quickly turn to why is it that we should even bother about community institutions you know <clears throat> and to me the single most important reason is that these are the nurseries of democracy you know uh, <clears throat> of course i'm making the the meta assumption that democracy imperfect though as it is is the best form of governing ourselves in all our diversity and differences and so forth and if that is so then <clears throat> we would have to learn to be democratic which means not just you know majoritarian uh, and therefore authoritarian but you know it's not i'm not talking about just electoral victory and you know elections as legitimizing everything but democracy in the sense that where the voice of everybody is heard decisions are made on the basis of participation and consideration and the <clears throat> you know it's recognized that on el- almost every question there shall be reasonable differences of opinion that it's possible for reasonable people to differ and just because they differ from each other they they need not demonize each other unfortunately that's what's happened now that, that even minor differences are exaggerated into a point where we are tending to demonize each other and that i put that squarely i put the blame of that on the fact that we adopted uh, a, a great constitution uh, you know we gave ourselves universal adult franchise and we gave ourselves constitution whose preamble is really inspiring but sadly it was a top down process 
and you know particularly after the independence movement while before the independence movement there was a mass participation in the struggle for freedom after the independence movement after we adopted the constitution except for electoral uh, uh, exercises every 5 years there was no significant attempt at enabling people to practice democracy on a day to day basis and all the institutions that were created for this whether the early stage panchayats or the early stage primary cooperatives you know they were all they very quickly became the last links in the chain of distributing state patronage rather than the first step in the ladder of democracy you know so instead of a resident welfare association or a gram sabha becoming a place where people would discuss debate and learn how to be democratic they became place where a few influential would get together become supplicants to whatever largest is, can be catched from the state and then basically <clears throat> you know uh, uh, take as much as you can all the problems of elite capture and so forth exclusion started happening they never became institutions for practicing democracy and to me therefore the single most important reason to build and to invest in community institution is to create a serious uh, you know uh, sandboxes in every quarter for learning how to be democratic and that of course will also then lead to emergence of leadership you know because in if every gram sabha has three or four contending public spirited leaders some of them will emerge and rise to the higher levels and indeed we have seen that in the self help group movement so many of the uh, women leaders from self help groups have joined uh, panchayats block panchayats even zila parishads in some cases and so forth so <clears throat> and then of course they would also learn how to deal with economic and uh, financial issues i mean as parmesh knows so well uh, you know starting from andhra pradesh and now in bihar and all over nrlm uh you know it's now quite common for an shg group to have more than a lakh of rupees in their bank account it's quite common for shg federations at the vo level to have tens of lakhs uh mandal mahila samakhyas which is only about 20 25 villages federations to have crores in their uh, of resources you know uh, so it is really quite uh, you know and and the power that it gives to the women is is therefore uh, very substantial in contrast the gram panchayats in spite of allocations from <clears throat> the 14th and now the 15th finance commission in spite of uh, you know uh, narega and other funding being available to them they have very little resources going to to them you know and therefore they do not have and even when those resources go it's highly schematized and they are really seen as uh, implementing agencies rather than you know the the uh, the sort of sense of autonomy that self and groups have so this brings me to my sort of <clears throat> uh, uh, last but one point which is what do we what should we do to strengthen these institutions and basically we have to live the long route of practice the long march of evolution of these entities these amorphous unorganized entities into effective local institutions can take decades but we have to first go through at least the you know the standard uh, well known phrase of forming uh, storming norming and performing you know so initially they get formed then they have fights eventually those conflicts have to be resolved norms emerge and then that's when they really start performing now this is a nice catch phrase a set of you know uh, but it this process can take 4 to 5 years you know and unless groups go through this this four phase stage of forming storming norming and then performing and if we impose performance on them on day one you may get it for a few days but basically it's not going to last the second thing which i want to echo about <clears throat> which rima ben also mentioned she mentioned about investment need for continuous investment 
I, I conceptualize it as a <clears throat> double helix of the evolution uh, of uh, institutions, of which one strand is uh, capacity, you know, the capability of, of the group to handle all types of issues, to manage both internally and externally. And the other is capital. And, you know, at any time, one of the two strands is uh, less than what is required. So sometimes they have more capital than they have capability, and sometimes they have more capability than they have capital. But that's the narrative of, that's the history of all institutions. And, you know, but the evolutionary path is to just keep going up that dual spi spiral and, you know, keep building capital and capability till they become, you know, such fantastic institutions as, for example, some of the Amul ones or some of the SH, mature SHG federations have become. And I want to end by by just mentioning what is it that should be avoided. And the first thing that needs to be avoided, and that's why I'm a bit nervous when Ashish mentioned that the prime minister decided to talk to self-help groups yesterday, because 1990, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu started talking to self-help groups, and that was the beginning of the uh, undoing of the self-help group movement in Andhra Pradesh. You know, politicization of, of community institutions on party political lines is the first thing that must be not just avoided, but must be resisted. They need to be political, but they should not be party political. And I think that distinction must be made and they should not be naively apolitical. There's no such thing as being apolitical, you know, but they should not be party political. And both political parties as well as community institutions need to work on this. The second thing is that they should not be seen as the last links in this patronage chain of the state, you know, which is, by the way, a serious problem with the NRLM. Uh, I've even heard officials from, uh, you know, some of these uh, state SRLMs talking about, oh, these are our women. Nobody else can deal with them. You know, what a peculiar attitude, you know, what is meant by our members of our women? You know, these are autonomous bodies and you are there to facilitate their growth. The third thing is, of course, we must do, must uh, guard against elite capture, which is happens particularly when resources accumulate. And we must guard against exclusion of the uh, of the most uh, of the poorest. And for example, in Bihar, the Bihar Rural Livelihood uh, Mission has tried to work against that uh, by launching a special program called SJY, Satat Jyotika Purjan Yojana, which is aimed at the poorest of the poor, you know. So all these are things that need to be avoided. But I'm very sure to end that unless we build and invest in our community institutions, the rest of it is all Maya. We can keep reading our constitution's preamble for the next 100 years. We will not get true democracy in India. We will not have functioning institutions all the way from the Supreme Court to the, uh, you know, the Gram Panchayats, unless we have community institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for, you know, that the, the full sweep of those comments. But I think particularly reminding us about the embeddedness of these of community institutions in associational life, which is social, political and economic, but also the institutions we haven't uh, paid enough attention to, uh, to begin with, whether they are, you know, thinking about Gram Sabhas, um, you know, in, in that form, but also those we may not have thought of yet. And it'll be interesting to see why don't we have certain kinds of institutions and why do we cultivate or develop others? Um, and that's maybe something we can discuss further. Um, but, you know, uh, you also brought towards the end about the state and politicization also the way in which the state thinks about these institutions at the, as the last leg. So the schematization uh, of these institutions uh, and, and, you know, whether it's NRLM or other programs uh, that does this. So we'll turn now to Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram and, you know, you have had such a long career in service also and seeing this from the perspective of the government and state institutions, but also serve as chairman of Maynard and very, um, very much see it from the community side as well. So, you know, for your reflections um, overall, but also perhaps on the role of the state 
the way the state has changed over the years in its engagement <clears throat> with these institutions at different levels. There's questions of center state um, uh, as well, um, and particularly the diverse roles the state plays. You know, we tend to reduce it to implementation of certain kinds of rural development schemes. Uh, but I think a number of people have already mentioned, you know, the different kinds of investments that are required. So I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mila. Uh, I have the very rare opportunity of working at the same time with the government and also with the voluntary organization. I could see what uh, mistakes we commit in government or what advantages we have in government. And similarly, what problems we have as an NGO or as a community-based institution. I will start with what uh, Vijay Mahajan just now said. In a democracy, community institutions are absolutely necessary. They need not be political, but they have to be closer to the people. I always believe any last mile approach has to be by the people and not by the government agencies. The first lesson I have learned in government is if you want to have a successful program, the last mile should be with the people's institutions and not with the government. It can be the Gram Sabha or it can be any self-help group or the federation. The delivery system should end with them because if you give it to the bureaucracy, a, it will not take place. B, there will be element of corruption. So I strongly believe that uh, for a very good development program, we need to involve the people, particularly at the ending point. Now, before I explain what I wanted to say for the future, let me narrate what are the lessons I have learned by simultaneous and also as a member on the governing body of Mairada and later as its chairman. See, there is a main difference between the government and a community-based institution. When we go in the government, we ask them what are their problems. Now, Vijay talked about uh, Gram Sabhas. In many cases, Gram Sabhas are the places where we collect the list of demands. People stand up and say, we want a school building, we want a drinking water well, we want this and that. We start from the needs. On the other hand, if you are a good voluntary organization, you start from what is the strength. We start with an appreciative inquiry. After all, people have been living in this country for several decades and they are capable of living. We need to pick up what is their strength and how they can build upon that. That is the biggest advantage of a community-based institution. In an SHG, 10 members are part of the SHG each one of them know the remaining nine. They know what their problems are. They know how it should be dealt with. So that is the major advantage. I always believe community institutions should therefore be the better agencies for implementing either the government program or their own programs. But the one problem is we need to have some kind of an ecosystem which will support these community groups. I find for a smaller organization, community institutions are the best. But if you want to expand that, you need to have some kind of a champion, some kind of a person in the government. I find from Mairada's point of view, we can start a program, we can learn the lessons, we can communicate the lessons. But to upscale, we need somebody, some champion. If it is a dairy cooperative, you need a Dr. Korean. If you want to have watershed development program, you need people from the NABAD or from the RBI who will give them the lending. You need to have people from outside. That is how the interaction between the government and the community-based institutions can work. The other point which we do in government is that if we create one person, we will give him all types of jobs. To give an example, when we got independence, there was a person called the district collector. And he was essentially a regulatory man. But when we wanted to take up the development programs, we kept it with the, in the hands of the collector. We identify somebody and hand over everything to him and ensure that he does not perform better. The same mistake we should not commit with community-based institutions. The self-help groups are doing very well and let them do what they are doing now. Handing them over the public distribution system or any other program will 
weaken them. So we need to identify what are the needs of a particular place and how do we meet those needs and who are the people who will meet the needs. Now, I believe the institutions in our country cannot deal with poverty, but they can deal with vulnerability. Today, our real problem is not poverty, but in the context of COVID, the vulnerability to poverty is bigger. We need to identify what are the issues which the community-based organizations can do. And if the community institutions are clear, they will be able to perform much better. Now, in my view, the biggest difference between the government and the community-based institutions is the trust. In government, there is very little trust between the top and the bottom and between the bottom and the people. Certainly, a block development officer cannot act without getting the clearance of somebody above him. Who gets the clearance of somebody above him? Whereas in the community-based institutions, there is no such hierarchy. They will be able to do themselves. But the person who is promoting the community-based organization should have the trust of the people. And if my people in Myrada have got the trust of the common man, we will be able to perform better. This is the biggest advantage which we need to make use of when we start building the community-based institutions. I agree with the view that we should have started from the bottom. Unfortunately, in our country, we start from the top. The correct approach would have been to have Gram Sabhas, there proceed to the Gram Panchayat, go to the Taluk Panchayat, go to the Jilla Panchayat and then go to the government. But that is not the case. We introduced decentralization in this country through a constitution amendment proposed by the government of India. And it's all a top-down system. This we will not be able to avoid because of historical necessities. Anyway, we now have them. They are in position, but we should ensure that they function independently. I believe the best available community institution today is the Gram Sabha. And we need to ensure that it functions. And below the Gram Sabha, for deepening of democracy, we have got self-help groups, we have watershed development associations, we have school betterment committees, we have umpteen number of committees, all of them are the community-based institutions. We need to strengthen them so that they feed into the Gram Sabha and Gram Sabha becomes the forum from where people's needs are met, people's capabilities are strengthened. This is what I would like to say to build a community-based organizations. Now, one last thing I want to mention, what is the new horizon? What is that we can do at the moment? We have severe financial crunch on one side. There is a problem of non-availability of adequate credit. We also have the COVID in the horizon. Now, with this sort of a situation, what is the next horizon? What is that we can do? Now, I talk as a non-government organization. What is that I can do for this community-based institutions? I see there are four things which we can do. The first one is farmers, producers, organizations, and they should not become government agencies. I don't want them to be even strictly a cooperative, even though Dr. Kurian started with the cooperatives. Later on, he said, I don't mind if they are not cooperatives also. We leave it to the people, let them decide what kind of institution they want. Farmers, producers, organizations on the lines of our dairy cooperative societies will certainly be the next set which we should try. Fortunately, the government also is supporting that there may not be much of problems and we in Myrada give high priority for farmers, producers, organizations. We identify which is the local produce where they can form a cooperative. That is the first area. The second area is something which the COVID has now given to us. There are large number of people who have moved from urban areas to the villages. Can we think of the micro, small, medium enterprises? which can link the local produce and the skill now available in the form of labor which have come through migration. If we can organize one kind of in MSME in each taluka or each block, whatever that is, that may be very good. It is also a scheme for which finding money may not be a problem. The third, there are several institutions even today which do not look at the people who have been bypassed by the process of development. What do I mean by that? Identifying Devadasis, identifying sex workers, 
people who are specially abled what is that we are doing for them the shg groups do they deal anything specifically for these people we have done that in mairada we organized it for devadasis we have it for sex workers we need to concentrate on the people who have been left out in the process of development that's a very good area which we can concentrate and finally i must honestly admit the present ecosystem may not be very congenial for organizing community based institutions all of us know that there are number of problems which an ngo will face which a community based organization will face but in my view if the general ecosystem is not good identify a bureaucrat or a leader who will be able to support your case and i always feel not all ngos are good you need to identify a good ngo and get the work done that is the view of a government officer the view of an ngo should be identify a good government officer who will support you there are still large number of people who are good and available within the government within the political system we need to make the best use of them unless we all work together it will be very difficult to deal with the problem of development as on today i hope situation will improve probably in the next 2 3 years when we are out of covid we will be able to provide better institutions and the new horizon could be brighter than what it is today thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir um i i think we'll come back to some of the directions and horizons that you've sort of pointed out uh, to us but um i think you've also made us you know reminded us about the importance of individuals of people and of champions and of the critical importance of trust so i think that is uh, you know something that again how to build trust and credibility in these processes i think is incredibly important um you also challenged i, I think a little bit of a challenge to our next speaker uh, who i'm going to turn to uh, parmesh shah who when you said that you know our institutions cannot address poverty they can address vulnerability but not poverty and i think that's a good challenge to you uh, in your role because i think your work has been about and is about looking at uh, poverty reduction so centrally and the role of these institutions again not just as welfare uh, but as essential vibrant parts of uh, an economy uh, and particularly when you look at agricultural jobs or even uh, rural livelihoods more generally so um i you can you might have a different view or a, a take on on that question but i wanted to turn to you also uh, to draw on your you know wide experience and it's been raised repeatedly about different kinds of investments and capacities and you know thinking a little bit about scale working with different state governments the experiences of working with different state governments working on national programs um and in comparative context but also the the dynamics of building institutions the kinds of institutional arrangements uh and investments that are required to sustain a large scale community based institution um institutions and programs at which they are the heart so it would be great to hear your your thoughts Th- thanks mekla and uh, it's good to hear from Vijay and uh, Minakshi Sundaram and Reema Ben, uh, I think uh, they have all have a very ringside seat, and I also had a ringside seat <laughs> because uh, when in the World Bank uh, we started going in this, we spent three years in learning from homegrown models in South Asia. Uh, that's what's not not known well that we went and studied Amul, we went and studied uh, you know Seva, we went and studied BRAC. we went and studied uh, you know lots of other examples which were there in india at that stage as well as in the region and clearly uh, what came through is that there were a lot of projectized investments and i would call as not as platform and ecosystem investments which were done so we did a uh, lot of uh, you know as vijay was describing a lot of short infusions of capital without building capabilities basically and we thought the capability would be a very important thing because once capability is built you could really do lots of things uh, with that capability and i think that has been the first focus but it was not easy because we went first to ap rajasthan and madhya pradesh with the same principles and we didn't have the same success in rajasthan and uh, you know uh, and and limited success in madhya pradesh but more success in ap Uh, primarily because people like vijay were involved in design of those programs from an early stage 
and we had uh, Dr. Koteya, chairman of NABAD, also participating in design. We had a very, very interesting ecosystem of designing those programs at that stage. And even in the beginning, it was not supposed to be only a credit program. There were pilots on panchayats. We, were, we really thought that these institutions, if we build a good quality social capital, it will influence the political capital also there. Then there was a pilot on uh, child labor because there was a lot of child labor in Andhra. So there was a lot of residential bridge schools which were built as part of those initial investment for uh, and ensuring that uh, the child labor problem is addressed there. Also a social action component uh, which had a lot of legal aid and others built to the poor women particularly and jointly done with NALSAR and others where we had almost at one stage 1600 lawyers working with community organizations at that stage which is not known because everyone knows now the credit and other part of it and then then there were big program with disabled vulnerable basically we set up specialist institutions of disabled of their own you know, disabled sanghas and others also at that stage so there was huge investment done in thinking that as Vijay rightly said, you need to try many things with these institutions to see what will work. But what we can say clearly is that the part which took off was the financial part and to some extent the livelihood part. The others also are there. Even right now, there are uh, gender social action committees on place. There is a legal aid program in place which is run. And Nalza runs it every year. It sends about 45 students to work with communities. So there is there is inherent, you know, pull effect. And what we thought that these institutions, if they reach intensity, density and capability, they will be able to influence the state institutions. They will be able to influence the market institutions. But more importantly, you will create the largest peer network of communities with them. And that is what has happened essentially because the journey from AP to Bihar is very interesting because when we went in 2006, 7 to Bihar and we did these, uh, you know, a lot of appraisals and we've spent a lot of time with communities, we spent at least two years talking to a lot of communities. We found that we will have to completely change the approach in Bihar compared to Andhra Pradesh. And because there was child labor, there was bonded labor, there were women being exploited. So you had to really do the first level, uh, you know, in initial work of building capacity of the women to go and, uh, you know, um, talk with each other, organize themselves because the state was nowhere in place. State was not even existent below block level. There's no one providing any services to people below block level. So it was to create that peer support and service delivery architecture, which is managed primarily by the communities themselves. And that was, I think, a very important thing that unless and until you create a critical mass of communities supporting each other. And then the women from other states came to Bihar, you know, women from AP came to Bihar and spent six months with them. Women from Bihar went to other Jharkhand. And so this is by far, I have never seen half a million women going from state to state, which is not known with great difficulty. Uh, their uh, men not allowing them to go fighting with their households and going there. So the empowerment part, which is not talked about, household level empowerment, uh, community level empowerment of women is a is a function of a lot of iteration which happens. As Vijay rightly described that metaphor of what you do, a lot of struggles have gone through in terms of you know at, arriving at some kind of equilibrium. But what we know is the state always tries to appropriate, you know, as Vijay knows that, you know, I've had so many interactions with, you know, all the chief ministers of Andhra Pradesh and encouraging them to not to appropriate, to let it, you know, uh, go there. But there is tremendous urge to appropriate. And, but what I would say across the political spectrum, I think more space has been created for community institutions to work on their own much larger than what it was earlier. So I am not saying that's the ideal situation, but it is a situation where you have almost like 70 million women are able to work with each other, work with market institutions, work with state. I'm also reminded of that 
women in Bihar had to ghera out the the bank bank uh, office bank uh, branches because they were their accounts were not getting opened. It, it looks like a very simple thing right now, but even getting a bank account open was a big struggle at that stage. And women took a lot of community action. And and I remember women uh, not letting a bank manager go out for 36 hours until he opened all the accounts there. So I think it is a it's a function of collective struggles which a lot of women have gone through in institutions to create that kind of an ecosystem there. Now it's unheard of that a bank manager will not open an account in any anywhere there. So I think these are small victories, but these victories then add up to what comes out there. I am also very encouraged by what has happened during COVID. I think we a lot of people were waiting for the state to come up. But these women losing their own resources, as Vijay has rightly said, have already produced uh, millions of masks. I think the figure right now is almost like 500 million masks have been produced. I imagine decentralized production happening at such a large scale in a country like India is only possible because there is a platform and they feel that they don't have to go to state to take an approval, which Mr. Minakshi Sundaram was also talking about. They don't go for anyone to take an approval millions of liters of sanitizer, millions of liters of that. And then the state goes to them and procures these things from them. And they say, okay, we will use that. So I, I find that uh, uh, I think I think the, the investment does not sometimes give you results uh, uh, immediately, but it gives you results when there's a crisis. But there are lots of problems here. The livelihood and the economic part has not developed that well. The reason why it doesn't develop well is because the state tries to use them for every purpose. Like Bihar government wants to do a sanitation Sacha Abhiyan, woman. They want to do a conservation Haryali Abhiyan, woman. So what happens is SSGs and the women institutions become Har Mars Ki Dawa. You know? And then you lose the complete focus on autonomous economic institutions because you have no time to do autonomous economic action as opposed to what you are doing, what state wants to you do. So that is a very big tension that if you succeed and your service delivery architecture below village level at village level doesn't exist, you feel that these institutions will fill the gap of the state. So going forward, I think there are three, four issues which we need to look at. I think we need to look at developing a dedicated, I would say, incubator for uh, state level institutions, panchayats and gram sabhas. If we had provided and we went to Bihar at the time when we did our project in Bihar, we went to government and said, can we do a similar thing with panchayats? You know, a dedicated mission where we'll support each panchayat to build capacity. And you can see that the political support for that was very low compared to the support for the woman empowerment part. The same leadership, although wanting to do it, only wanted to construct panchayat bhavans and not really do the software and the empowerment part of the panchayats because they thought that the political power would be affected if the empowerment happens at the panchayat level. So it's a real uh, challenge. But I think uh, there is time to now build uh, what I would call is a last mile service delivery requires very drastic change. It requires entrepreneurship. It requires new kinds of leadership. And uh, I don't think government has the capacity to deliver services below a particular level. And unless and until we reform that. Uh, we see a lot of interesting models emerging where local governments have franchised certain services to SSGs. Like you can see the waste recycling part is being done in Tamil Nadu on a great scale by SSG Federation. They've almost taken over all the plastic waste recycling business of, of what state what earlier used to do. So there is franchising of last mile service delivery is requires a very big effort uh, because in absence of that, the economic services will not work. Second, we need at block level an incubator for community institutions, which Minakshi Sundaramji was also talking about. I think we need a block level uh, intensity of support to incubate the all types of institutions, not just the SSGs, basically, so that there is a continuous influx of capacity building and support to those institutions there. 
and we tr- have started working on that in now Tamil Nadu particularly, which is the government which has picked this up. So 45 block level incubators now being set up uh, to really help community institutions to go to the next level and become more autonomous, more entrepreneurial and, and build both capabilities and capital to do that. This needs every block of the country needs a way to nurture that, you know, that. And then probably what Rima Bin was saying, a fund to accompany that. Now, the government really does this in piecemeal basis. The NRM does certain things. They have now a dedicated fund for FPOs. That's fine. I think that's also required because you need multiple things to do. But I think the time has come to really make investment of capabilities and incubation. It requires incubation approach. It doesn't require a kind of a straight approach where you just do something and then it will get results immediately. There's a lot of back and forth which happens. No institution gets built without iteration. In fact, what is institution? Institutions are norms uh, iterated over a period of time. And that's what institution means. You know, institution doesn't come out of uh, some theory or something. If norms get developed and why are SSG movement successful? Because millions of women meet every week. They set up their norms. They take decisions. And once they keep on taking decisions, uh, zillions of times in India, then becomes an ecosystem out of that. So I think we need incubation and we need a fund to accompany that. Uh, the th- final thing I would like to say is that the micro enterprise uh, field, which is the informality part, which we haven't talked for which Seva was formed to do informality. Informal women, informal entrepreneurs, informal producers are not supported well by existing institutions. So we need a micro enterprise incubator also in the same way, where uh, uh, women who are doing currently nano enterprises are able to convert nano into micro and micro into others. Then there's a whole issue of service delivery economy. Services are 60% of what the country's economy is. So care economy, services economy, this has to become a bigger element of support now. I think a lot of women have very funda- funda- very good ideas. We Women are running Diviki Rasoi cafes in all the hospitals in Bihar right now because the state has decided that they will franchise all the catering services to women. Now, imagine if every hospital was being supported to uh, such kind of uh, food delivery enterprises, it will, it will change the complexion of so many opportunities would come. So I would say micro enterprise incubator, incubator for, you know, uh, community institutions and capability and capital to go together. So, so those are my kind of thoughts at this stage. I was, no, it's very random, but I'm very encouraged by what others are saying at this stage also because they are also in a very reflective mode. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and those are very systematic thoughts, actually, and have laid out a very interesting uh, another space for us to discuss. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time for discussion. But <clears throat> I also just wanted to p- remind everyone, you've pointed out, I think, one of also the essential tensions when you empower people, right, or when people are empowered, and the tension with the state as well, right, the institutional activism that also emerges from large-scale collectivization. I remember with Maila Samakya, they were very upset when the Nadi Adalats came because Nadi Adalats were not supposed to come up. This was an education program. They didn't have a definition for Nadi Adalats coming out of an education program. But they were incredibly successful and it took a lot of courage to bring them out. And I think when the state mobilizes people, but people are also... Uh, then active, uh, you know, active agents, uh, you see a really interesting tension and a lot of um, activism that comes up here too. And that's something that's a constant back and forth. So you mentioned both the empowerment and the challenges of that. Um, and then I think you set out a lot of very interesting questions, which I'm sure Isabel uh, Greer will turn to next, will take forward, because I wanted to ask you a little bit to reflect, you know, India extremely well, but so many other contexts as well, uh, to think comparatively um, and for us to learn a little comparatively. But your work is so much focused on scaling. And, to, you know, the questions have already been raised about time about the number of organizations, about scale, about institutional arrangements, about the kind of support required at different levels, uh, about capacities. So, uh, you know, as you think about the history, the past, what we've learned, comparative context and the future, some reflections on all of this would be wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, A wonderful panel. I'm 
I'm really enjoying listening to all of you. And of course, I'm having here Rima, Kapila Ben, and Parmesh, who have all been inspirations for what I do today. Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful. So um, uh, thinking about, about the task that I was uh, giving Mekala, um, I thought that a very good example in terms of the evaluations that have been done and the scale that it reached and the lessons uh, would be to think about the community development project in uh, Indonesia, uh, which actually reached 80 million people, 70,000 villages, 8,000 islands in different time zones and, and built from the community uh, uh, bridges, roads, irrigation, um, and took you know 15 years to get to 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 scale. Um, um, and there were a lot of uh, uh, lessons about this. It's it's more about service delivery. What I'm going to talk about that actually creating a democracy. But I think there are a lot of lessons. And then I'll speak a little bit about a few studies that we have done. A more specific to India. So first of all, um, the, the, the beginning of this community development uh, program was a very sort of revolutionary idea in Indonesia and inside the World Bank that was supporting that, which is at the local level, people know what to do. They know what they need. They know how to build a road. They just need support and capacity in order to do it. And this was a real, the pilots were very genuinely starting from, from the bottom up, understanding what they needed and then building the capacity to, to get there. And also the realization very early on that in order for this to work, it was key uh, to redesign the state processes. So if you think about the belief in the community, which is a disruption to the way things are usually done, uh, the state processes had to shift in order for this to really get to scale. So these processes had to be simple. Procurement processes had to be simplified hugely, for example, both in the government, but also in the World Bank. That was a big fight. Uh, that simplified procurement process, we're talking about, about very different uh, uh, goods and, and contracts. Contracts had to be simplified. Um, accountability had to be there, but designed in a way that was very pragmatic. You could not import the ideas of accountability into these projects like we did in others because it, it wouldn't work. Uh, so there's a, there was a lot of design work, and I would say design thinking in terms of having at the center the community, the village and understanding what processes would work. Um, then the evaluation of performance, a really important aspect. How do you evaluate? What you measure is what you get. The timelines had to completely shift. You could not be evaluating uh, results year by year, but you really had to think about a much longer term uh, process, so a much more adaptive way of evaluating. Another important mind shift was for communities not to be seen as beneficiaries, but rather to be seen as stakeholders and key actors of these, of these projects and as an important asset for things to work. The village's view on what was needed was an asset on which the government would be drawing. Of course, this is easier said than done, but it requires a really a real shift at many levels um, on, on on, on the communities. Um, and then um, it took 10 years, which I don't think is that uh, long, uh, of community work to develop a culture where the communities would actually monitor the government. There was a lot of corruption in Indonesia, and this is the reason that this community development uh, project started in, in a crisis. Um, and the question was also that the, the government wanted also the communities to monitor whether they, whatever was supposed to get to them was getting to them. And that took 10 years because it's a lot of work in terms of empowerment, agency, and, and feeling that you really have the, the, the tools to be able to, to monitor. So I think uh, Indonesia is a really good example of what it takes to scale. Uh, as I said, the main messages is a system change, which includes the change in the government. 
I wanted to bring two other things if I have time. Uh, one is our research uh, that we've been doing uh, with 3IE on um, defunct or, or, or not well-functioning SAGs in Madhya Pradesh. And w there was an evaluation which showed that, you know, there was a lot of variability and they asked us to do a qualitative evaluation on those who were not working well. And we have a paper where we show um, that there were two issues really important that some of the speakers mentioned. Uh, one uh, was the reliance on the internal village hierarchies. The fact that the programs would get in, but the empowerment or the capture, uh, the elite capture would basically uh, be the, the reason for, for, for this non-performance. And the second one, again, very related to this example, was the tension on the local empowerment and the local government official understanding the importance of local empowerment. And NRLM, for example, has a lot of references to this importance and the tension of living within a very hierarchical system. So when it comes to a local government official reporting about the performance, uh, those performance criteria are going to be coming the driving force and the most important criteria for the government official rather than what the community needs. And so that tension illustrates the importance of changing the, the government systems for, for this to work. Um, and the final uh, point I wanted to make is we've been doing uh, research and I'm very happy that B BJ brought so clearly the fact that it's not only SAGs, but there's all this tradition in India about other community institutions. And we've been looking at cooperatives. We've been looking at, at women cooperatives uh, in India. And, um, it, but we've been bringing the international experience and looking how cooperatives like Mondragon uh, in Spain, uh, in the Basque country, have really shown during COVID a very different type of behavior than profit maximizing um, uh, companies. Mondragon is a very high performing uh, set of cooperatives. And during COVID, they're owned by the workers. During COVID, they did not fire workers. They kept the workers, uh, which is very different to what we saw in many other profit maximizing uh, organizations. And I think this has, in a way, it also inspired, and this is thinking about the future, at least in the US, there's a lot of conversations about reimagining capitalism, about what COVID has taught us about moving from the individual profit maximizing organizations, which has been sort of at the center of, of attention, to one where people are really questioning this. In COVID, we saw the limits, we saw the cracks, in this system. And cooperatives are very small in the US, uh, but the, the inspiration of seeing what cooperatives have done in the world is one where there's a lot of research going on right now as to what role they can play in reimagining capitalism. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. I think, you know, Vijay Mahajan reminded us about the role of collectives or the, the power that they have in democracy and in cultivating and growing democracy and its importance. And you've just talked about the reimagination of capitalism that is happening and, and the importance of collectives and community institutions and cooperatives uh, to think through that. So I, I actually hope we have a little bit of time because I do have a question for all of you on the thinking about the economy. And I think, again, it was raised, you know, when we think about seva and informality. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's something we could hopefully come back to if we have a little bit of time. Uh, Roshni has just informed me that I think Kapila Ben's um, mic is now working. And so if we can, before we move into uh, the, the Q&A and some further discussion, it would be wonderful to hear from her. Kapila Namaste. Namaste. Hello, <laughs> 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 
मैं मैं आपको बताती हूँ कि जब हम सेवा में नहीं जुड़े थे तो हम चार दीवार के अंदर थे और हमारी कोई मालिक ही नहीं थी हमारी कोई पहचान नहीं थी लेकिन जब हम और हम जब खड़ी में काम करने के लिए जाते थे तो वहाँ पर हमारे ऊपर मालिक का भी शोषण हुआ करता था और जब मालिक शोषण करता था तो दूसरा ऐसा भी होता था कि हम तम्बाकू के खड़ी में काम में जाते थे और तम्बाकू के खेत में काम जाते थे सभी जगह पर हमारा शोषण होता था लेकिन जब हम सेवा में जुड़े और संगठन में हमको अलग अलग सेवा मैनेजमेंट स्कूल से अलग अलग तालीम जब ली तो तालीम के बाद हमको पता चला के हम हमारे हमको संगठन में जुड़ने के लिए क्या क्या हमारे जीवन में समस्या का हल होता है तो इसी तरह से हम सेवा के साथ जुड़े और उसमें हमको सेवा मैनेजर्स के स्कूल में से हमको तालीम दी तभी हमको पता चला कि मैं एक आगेवान मैंने आगेवान की लीडरशिप की मार्केटिंग की खेती की सभी तरफ प्रकार की मैंने तालीम दी तो इसी तरह तालीम दी फिर बाद में हमने हमारी जब हमारे जब खेत में हम काम हमारे श्रीमान खेड़ू जब खेत में काम करते थे हमारी सेवा की सदस्य संख्या में हमने देखा तो हमारा अट्ठानवे हजार सदस्य जो हमारे श्रीमान खेड़ू थे तो उसमें से हम जब हम, हम फिर बाद में हमको पता चला कि नहीं हमारा खुद की खुद मालिक ही होनी चाहिए तो हमने हमारा खुद का गांव में से हमने मंडल में जुड़े और हम जब हमारे एसोसिएशन में से हमने लोन ली लोन लेकर हमने मोबाइल खरीदा और मोबाइल से हमने व्यापारी के साथ संकलन किया जब व्यापारी के साथ संकलन किया तभी हमको पता चला कि नहीं व्यापारी तो व्यापारी के साथ संकलन किया तो हमारे सीमान खेड़ के पास तो कुछ आता ही नहीं था व्यापारी बड़ा होता था और दूसरे के अंदर से दलाली भी दलाली खा जाता था तो इसी तरह से काम होता था फिर बाद में हमने हमारे सदस्यों को बताया कि यहाँ पर तो ऐसा चल रहा है कि मालिक तो व्यापारी आगे बढ़ रहा है पैसे लेकर और दूसरा के दलाल भी दलाली लेकर आगे बढ़ रहा है लेकिन जो हमारा सीमान खेड़ते वो तो भूखा का भूखा रह जाता है तो इसी तरह से हमारी बहनों को हमने बताया तो हमारी बहनों ने हमको किया कि नहीं ऐसा नहीं होना चाहिए तो हमने हमारे एसोसिएशन में से हमने लोन ली और लोन हम, हमने हमारी खुद की कंपनी शुरू की वो नाम है हमारा रूढ़ी रूढ़ी कंपनी की क्योंकि हमारे श्रीमान खरीद के पास आवक होनी चाहिए तो इसी तरह से हमने जब हमारी खुद की कंपनी शुरू की तो उसमें हमने हमारे खेड़ श्रीमान खेड़ के पास हम घर बैठे उनके पास से सामान खरीदते हैं और वहां से हम उनको घर बैठे जो बाजार भाव चलता है वो हम देते हैं तो उनकी आमदनी भी बढ़ी दूसरा के वहां से लेकर हम हमारे प्रोसेसिंग सेंटर में जब जाते हैं तो हमारी जो श्रीमान श्रम जी बहने हैं उनको काम नहीं मिलता है तो उनको हमने साफ सुफ करने के लिए काम भी मिलवाया तीसरा मैं बताती हूँ कि वहां से लेकर जब हमारी रूढ़ी बहन गाँव में जाती है बेचने के लिए तो उनको भी कमीशन मिलता है तो उनको भी आमदानी मिलनी मिली तो अथा में बताती कि जो लोग हमारे पास से रूढ़ी का सामान खरीदते हैं तो उनका पूरा घर का पोषक आहार मिलता है तो इसी तरह से हमने हमारी कंपनी की शुरुआत की और उसमें ऐसा हुआ दूसरा मैं बताती कि रूढ़ी कम अलग अलग प्रकार की कंपनियां होती है होगी लेकिन जब श्रम जी बहनों की कोई कंपनी अभी तक नहीं हुई लेकिन जब सेवा ने वो कंपनी शुरू की और वो कंपनी का नाम भी हमारी रूढ़ी बहन का नाम है और दूसरा मैं बताती हूँ कि अभी तक हमारे संगठन में पच्चीस खेड़ूते जुड़े हुए हैं हमारे और अग्ञान प्रोसेसिंग सेंटर हमारा चल रहा है और चार हजार हमारी रूढ़ी बहने हैं और दूसरा मैं बताती हूँ कि हमारी कंपनी नो टर्न टर्न ओवर तीस करोड़ से ज्यादातर हो रहा है तो इसी तरह से हमारा काम चल रहा है दूसरी मैं आपको बता दी हर एक कंपनी में जब पढ़े लिखे होते हैं और बड़े बड़े लोग होते हैं लेकिन जो हमारे श्रम के बहनों की जो रूढ़ी कंपनी है उसमें तो हम खुद उत्पादक है हम खुद मालिक है और हम खुद मैनेजर है तो इसी तरह से हम सेवा में काम करते हैं और दूसरा मैं खास करके बताती हूँ कि जब हम संगठन में जुड़े तो हमको पता और संगठन होना ही चाहिए क्योंकि श्रम जी बहनों की कोई आवाज नहीं सुनता और संगठन होता है तो उसमें से हम हमारा जो कोई प्रश्न होता है तो संगठन की ताकत से हमारी श्रम जी बहनों की जो समस्या है वो हम हल कर सकते हैं और दूसरा मैं आपको बताती हूँ कि हम खुद अभी तक ऐसा होता थे कि हमारी कोई खुद पहचान नहीं थी लेकिन सेवा में जुड़े तो हमारी खुद की पहचान हुई और हम खुद एक मालिक और एक मालिक और मैनेजर भी हो गए बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद हमें अच्छा लगा कि एटलीस्ट हम आपकी माइक चलने लगे और आपके हम बात सुन पाए और आप हमें याद भी दिलाए हो कि संगठन के महत्व क्या होती है और कितनी मेहनत लगता है इसमें इसमें बनाना तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद 
I wish we had a little more time. I don't know, Rima Ben, I don't know if there was a, a translation that was worked out. Uh, I hope people have been able to, those who speak Hindi would have understood. Um, but maybe otherwise we can have a transcript and put it up uh, so that those who haven't been able to uh, understand can, and then we put it up on the forum. Uh, it'll be great for, I think, everybody to hear uh, and to be reminded of what it takes to really form a, a you know, an institution uh, of, of women uh, and women leaders. So uh, thank you so much. Um, we have very little time. Uh, I've been told, I don't like this word hard stop, but there is a hard stop at five, five, uh, at five past five, which leaves us with about, you know, uh, nine minutes. Uh, but I, you know, if there are questions, uh, Roshni or Shivani will please let me know and we'll take some audience questions. Um, but I wanted to, you know, having heard particularly Kapila Bell's um, voice, uh, ask two questions. If, if, and then you know, we can just go in groups, or whoever would like to answer it and go down the group as it as you wish. But one is on how systems change in the process of doing community mobilization. I mean, one of the things I have spent a lot of time thinking about are the frontline workers, the bureaucrats, the state systems themselves. Right, um, other kinds of institutions, whether it's banks and bank managers, and how they have to change, right, in this process. We've talked a lot about what happens to the communities, to community empowerment, to their perspectives, to their experiences. But I think it's really important we don't spend enough time also thinking about how hard it is to to do this work. Um, I remember many frontline workers and mobilizational work is very difficult. Many times they come from the same communities and grow into these roles um, and fall, as you know, Minakshi Sundaram was also saying, between the state and the community. It is difficult and, and complex. And I just wanted to have all of you reflect on, you know, how, as I've always seen, like, if I meet an officer who had had a good total literacy campaign district, they are different from that experience of having mobilized and worked with communities in a different way. So I would just, you know, one was to think about it the other way around, how institutions and in the state transforms, banks transform, institutions transform. Uh, the second is many of your comments have talked deeply about the state. Um, but I would really love to hear a little more about what you think about the Indian economy. Uh, the economy as an entity, as an institutional, entity, as an ecosystem, as an organization. I remember informality is so central. Um, we talked about, you know, you should learn from uh, dairy cooperatives. We must. But then other commodities are deeply different. Uh, we always talk about disintermediation. But often the intermediaries are also small. They are also traders, small traders and farmers. We have, uh, you know, it's not all big capital versus small. Our economy is also made up of micro enterprises. Inefficiency is not always our problem. Exclusion is often a bigger problem. Our agricultural markets are less inefficient than we think they are. And when collectives enter, they encounter those challenges as well. So, you know, some reflections on the nature of the Indian economy and the challenge that the economy in the way in which it is highly regional, highly intermediated, many different kinds of differentiation, power is distributed in certain ways, uh, assets are unequal, um, a wide variety of institutions. Um, how you negotiate or think about that as you think about the future? Um, I think, yeah, I'll stop here and leave it to all of you. Um, so we could just go down the panel again um, for closing remarks. Rima Ben? Thank you so much, and you post um, the formal sector and the state, and how do you want, how do we see that changing? I don't think they will change at all. It's a waste of time, and it's a waste of, you know, one's energy. Uh, what we feel is that if 93% of the workforce in the country is in the informal sector, that is the mainstream. And why should 93% change to fit into the 7%? I mean, we are talking about a completely imbalance. And therefore, I think uh, it's the 7% whose mindset will have to change that how do they now learn to partner with the 93% 
whom they have been excluding for knowingly or unknowingly for whatever reason. the movement and the MFIs in the country doing so well because the public sector banks were not really, you know, had that courage or willing to take on the risks. So I think um, what we would like to propose and that is that, you know, one, when we are charting our new economic pathways, hopefully post-COVID, whenever that comes, we don't know when will post-COVID also be there, a situation. It has to be an economy which is a nurturing economy. I think the current state of affairs and the economy that we have is created a model. And I think at least I'm speaking from our members and they definitely do not want the kind of economy. I don't think uh, Kapila Benz of today will wait for the government to do something. They are taking on the courage to be in the open market, to compete in the market and, you know, stand on their own feet. And that's what the women have demonstrated. And I think it's time that, you know, the leaders, the policy makers, the institutions realize that women need to be consulted and asked to play an important role in policy making. Thank you. Thank you so much. Vijay Mahajan. Uh, I, I share uh, Hima Ben's, uh, you know, point that <clears throat> uh, dealing with uh, big business and big state, uh, we might as well, you know, not waste our time. You know, my attitude toward these two is that think of the state as a cantankerous fuddy daddy uncle, you know, you, you just have him and, you know, and one day they will fade away, hopefully. But in the meantime, they have all the resources and you have to keep them pleased if you want any inheritance from them. And think of the big business as your prodigal son who's taken away a lot of your resources and affection and doesn't give it back any much in return. So, but despite that, we have to carry on with life and we have to still treat these people as our relatives. And, and deal Can with yeah, no, can I just say, I, I completely agree with you, but I would really love to hear what you think about not the big business, the intermediary okay. business, the informal, informal, the 93% is also a tough economy for collectives. Yeah. Right? The, you know, agriculture markets are good examples. Most of it doesn't go anywhere formally. Okay, so, so for the informal sector, hmm. you know, instead of this rush to formalize, which is right now one of the ruling sort of uh, unstated ideologies. I would say that the informal sector should rush to occupy those commons which are still not fully colonized by, by either the capital or the state. And my, I think there are two big examples of this. One is the internet, you know, the, the entire digital world. It is still, I mean, while, while there is still already a digital divide, but the, you know, the possibility of exclusion there are much less than than it is so if today we can just go and squat in the internet space you know every poor household every woman everyone who's excluded is enabled to squat in the internet world you know we'd be we'd have a much more equal world digital world 10 years from now the other one is environment you know basically the 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 re, the reuse recycle uh, reduce that space uh, is largely been vacated by the by the state and not very much except for you know greenwashing not used by the large business so the informal sector should move in here <clears throat> and truly occupy in other words gdp for the informal for the lower part of the sector economy should be green and digital so green and digital prosperity is really we should just appropriate that for ourselves you know, so that's broadly what I would say. These are definitely new horizons coming from old practices of squatting and occupying uh, yes. and taking over space. New horizons, old, good, well tied and tested strategies uh, of. Uh, and rat picking. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, fugitive spaces. Um, yes. Um, so, Minak Shindram, sorry, you have a minute. I think we are being yeah. <laughs> rapidly, yeah. I'm quite optimistic. My only answer is decentralization. 
do not think of the country think of a state or think of a district and if you deal with the problems you can solve the problem there and you will always find one good person at the lower level and i find it is easier to work with the gram panchayat than with the central government that is the answer very well thank said sir very well said thank you so much sir that was, yes parmesha so i think i am also very optimistic like minakshi sundaram ji i think uh, there is we are clearly seeing in the covid uh, mm. Uh, uh, these micro enterprises occupying using digital technologies a meso space in terms of local food markets deliveries of food and care economy and all those things so i would say the green part the recycling circular economy uh, the 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 part in the care economy the service economy and also i would say even small manufacturing also the number of women making solar lights the sg is making solar lights and the setting up companies to produce solar lights has phenomenally increased at this stage so there are very niche opportunities as vijay said and i think we have to occupy those niche opportunities and make them bigger but incubation is required for all these uh, informal enterprises to graduate to higher productivity or to occupy a larger space that's it thank you thank you so much and finally Isabel, final comments, Isabel Guerrero. Yeah, I, th I think with COVID, we've seen a system that is in crisis, not just in India, it's everywhere, all over the world. And we've also seen that women leaders have been so much better uh, at dealing with COVID that uh, there's a big study of 194 countries. Uh, those with women leaders, even if you, you know, uh, control for size, they had half of the deaths of countries leading, uh, led by men. And I think that's the transformation that needs to happen. I'm not sure I'm that optimistic, but I think that is the biggest transformative shift that we can see for the future. Well, thank you so much. This has been a, you know, a absolutely amazing, very deep, reflective and imaginative panel. I think it has given us a great dose of principles, but also a lot of pragmatism uh, and a sense of possibility. Uh, above all else. Um, and possibility is tough. We know the same spaces that secrete um, closure also provide different kinds of openings at other times. And I think this idea, the spirit of, uh, of, of occupation, uh, you know, in all of its meanings, livelihood, um, but also as taking the space uh, that you rightfully uh, need to occupy both in our polity, politics, society and economy. So thank you so much. It was really a, a, an amazing panel to moderate. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste, Kapila Ben. Namaste.